Okay, hi everyone. So this is my uh, yearly CPU isolation talk. I do that for uh, several years now. So um, this is going to be about uh, all the stuff that has been that have been done uh, since last year, last LPC on the CPU isolation front. A uh, quick reminder what CPU isolation is. So briefly, you have a task that you want to execute on the CPU and you don't want that task to be disturbed by the kernel. Uh, so from the lowest level to the highest, you don't want to be disturbed by IRQs, exceptions like faults, and then tasks and work queues and stuff like that. So this is a very extreme kind of workload. And this is typically configured uh, using the NoHertz full kernel parameter, right? So you just pass a set of CPUs that are going to be isolated forever until the last reboot. Uh, so since last LPC, um, so for several years, one of the biggest issues that we had was the VMstat um, work use. So VMstat, I guess most of you know what this is about. This is uh, a statistics gathering uh, from memory that you can access through a CCFS. But the VMstat thing I'm talking about here is the work queue component that folds the memory statistics per CPU. And this is a work queue that executes every second. And it's very annoying for extreme workloads that don't want to be disturbed because that's every second one interruption and potentially uh, scheduling a work queue. So very disturbing. And uh, there have been several attempts across the years to solve that solution from uh, Marcelo Tosetti, um, led by me through solutions that didn't work. Uh, we first tried to do explicit quiescing of that uh, VMstat thing through explicit calls, like through PRCTL. Uh, so the goal was that before running extreme workload, you issue a PRCTL that folds all the VMstat uh, statistics. So then you don't get to, to uh, suffer from the, the VMstat timer and work you. Uh, that didn't work because, um, oh, because of many reasons. <laughs> we also tried the implicit quiescing, which involved uh, folding the VMstat statistics on every return to user space. But uh, here the reason was obvious. It was quite some overhead on every syscall, every interrupt. So uh, that didn't work very well. And eventually they uh, realized uh, with the memory management people that we can live with some imprecision and accuracy of uh, uh, VMstat statistics. So we don't actually need to periodically uh, fold all the statistics. We can just live with a few calls from time to time folding the statistics. So on the Hertz full CPUs, we just don't schedule any more uh, VM stats. That's solved. Actually, maybe officially solved and maybe unofficially it's a problem because we have seen lately some issues with um, memory pressure artificially created by VM stats. And maybe Tomas is going to talk about that. No, uh, I was just yeah. having a question. Why don't you do it remotely? I've... I mean, have, we had it in RT for a while. Mm -hmm. have, a, have, have locks around it, which are usually not contended because they are per CPU. And in the case of isolating them, then you just fold it remotely. And because then the isolated CPU is not going to contend on the lock. Mm -hmm. And so you, so you just have to, yeah. to touch the foreign cache lines, but you can delegate it to the housekeeping CPU. That would be the obvious solution for the problem. Well, Without think, all the heuristics. I think they, they, they considered it, but they just thought that simply not actually folding the statistics. That often was fine, was fine, but it seems that there is a problem. Yeah, so maybe, Not I don't know. Not surprised. Yeah, right. 
some memory management people in the room wanting to solve that one day? So we have to take the memory. No, I did stuff. Oh, you did? Um, oh yes, you're you're not you. It is the. No, he's not. Username. Oh yeah, okay. All right. A brief word about different IPIs. Um, so IPIs, of course, are some source of disturbance for CPU isolation. Um, one solution for some IPIs, mainly those that don't have callbacks to carry on, uh, one solution is to defer IPI execution when uh, CPU runs isolated until that CPU comes back to the kernel. So as long as the CPU is running in user space, it can defer the execution of an IPI until it goes back to the kernel. Um, so Valentin is working on that, I guess. What we're... kind of IPI is talking about? Are we talking about? <laughs> Can I use that one? You can use this one, yeah. They just, you won't be on camera. It's use that other one, because the camera follows that one. Yeah. Um, so the later status was we were looking at a patch up, a text update for static keys, <coughs> and we sort of got consensus that we could defer some IPS for VM analogs. Uh, the problem uh, I'm facing at the moment, well, it's mostly uh, time to work on that because I've been preempted by other stuff. It's mostly the uh, infrastructure side of things because I've been working on having tooling to make sure that deferring those IPI is not going to cause issues. Um, for static keys, for instance, um, we don't want uh, static keys in early entry code that can be changed uh, at runtime. So we have this uh, little annotation for um, read only after init. So do study keys are okay. If they only modify that init, then we're good. We know they're not going to be modified. So if we anchor to them in early entry code, they're safe. Um, I've realized that we have some that don't match that. Uh, and it's, it's more of an infrastructure issue. So for instance, uh, because of all of the nice mitigations we now have on return to user space and entry to idle, one of them, for instance, is just as we are about to enter idle, uh, we have a static key that we can hit. And I've been using the uh, no instrumentation annotation as this is early entry. Unfortunately, in this case, this is more like early exit, which doesn't matter for us, but my instrumentation is picking this as like a problematic log. So I need to spend time, unfortunately, on the infrastructure that checks that this is all safe. That's where I'm at at the moment. Okay. You're the right people, yeah. Yep. Hey. <laughs> Anyone else? Or continue? Okay. Uh, CPU said V2 has seen some improvements. Uh, well, enhancement. Um, so CPU sets is used for CPU isolation in order to isolate a given set of C uh, uh, a task to some partition of CPUs. So if you want to, I to uh, run a a critical task to say um, uh, CPU2, you create a partition of CPU2 and make sure that it's not going to run anywhere else and it's not going to be disturbed by other tasks. Um, on CPU set V2, in order to have an exclusive set of CPUs, you have to create a kind of partition that is called root partition, which is not to be confused by the top level root partition, it's actually a, a, a type of partition, right? And um, if you want to create a root kind of partition, the constraint is to have the parent partition to be root as well. So for example, here we have the uh, top root C group, which has uh, eight CPUs, zero from seven. Uh, we create a CPU set one, first child, which contains half of the CPUs, and it has two more children, which are which uh, uh, one of which has a zero and one CPUs, and the other one has two and three. Uh, if you want to uh, for CPU set two and CPU set three to uh, be exclusive, 
Like if you want to be sure that CPU set two uh, has CPU zero and one and no other uh, CPU set is going to have zero and one, you, you, you need to have those CPU sets to be root. And if you want CPU set two and CPU set three to be root, the constraint so far was that CPU set one had to be root as well. But on some workloads, um, you need, you, 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 have, you can have a tree that is much more distributed. And so it's, I don't know exactly why, but it's apparently complicated to, uh, to have all these tree, distributed tree uh, to be uh, a root made of only root partitions. So the, there is a new feature here here that has been introduced, which is called the remote partitions, and which doesn't suffer from that constraint to have a parent root partition, which means you can have uh, all your ancestors except the top level as uh, non-root partitions. So for example, here, if you want to have CPU set five and CPU set six, to be root partitions, you don't need to have CPU set four as a root partition, but you have to make sure that all the ancestors of CPU set five and CPU set six to uh, define a set of exclusive CPUs. <coughs> Do you understand what, I, what I'm saying? Yeah, kind, of. yeah, kind of, kind of. It's very complicated, yeah. It took me some time to understand the thing to be honest. So, once you have written the CPU's exclusive uh, file of CPU set four, and you have written it for CPU set five and six as well, and you make sure that CPU set five and six have mutually exclusive set of CPUs, and that CPU set five and six are subsets of the CP, of the exclusive CPUs of CPU set four, then finally you can uh, define five and six as root partitions. And those are remote root partition. Is it clear? It never gets clear. Right. <laughs> kind of. Kind of, I'm just missing the use case. Me too. Ask. <laughs> Ask the original and, author of the... And, that's, and, and that is the version <laughs> two. I only had time to understand how it works, but not as well, much time to understand in why. The case, the use case is um, the, uh, for containerized workload, like um, the Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, they <clears throat> need to manage the, all the sub-container uh, on a high-level um, CPU set, but then it, it doesn't want to be using exclusive CPU. So you, you use just using the, so uh, within the, um, the high level um, C group, you can have a, a set of CPU that contain both uh, exclusive and non-exclusive one. So um, the, the control demon will use the, non, the household one, the non-exclusive one, and then distribute the exclusive CPU down to the low level um, uh, C group or CPU set to be isolated CPU. Uh, that is the use case that are requested by our uh, OpenShift team. So mm -hmm. that is the reason why we, we implement this uh, feature. Yeah. So uh, real quick, one last thing, or maybe I'll, uh, so I'm kind of lost on this as well. Me too. And I'm trying to understand the difference, wait, so what is the difference between a local and a remote? I don't want to be like, I don't want to be. Prepared. So a local has to have uh, all, its, all its ancestors as root partitions. Oh. Whereas a remote root partition has to have all its ancestors as non-root partitions, except for the top, le top level. Okay, um, maybe I can explain it. The original implementation of uh, CPU partition is that it, it get exclusive CPU from its parent. So to, to get that exclusive CPU, the parent also need to have exclusive CPU. And so you have to be a partition root um, before you can distribute the exclusive CPU down, down 
down the line. Uh, with the new version 6.7 kernel, uh, we add a new uh, control file called CPU, uh, CPU setup exclusive. Uh, no, no, CPU setup CPU dot exclusive, and that uh, allow you to distribute the exclusive CPU down the tree without actually becoming a partition with uh, yourself. So I'm just curious if that um, CPU set four, the exclusive didn't have to be four seven, or is that the different? Uh, right Usually now? the the exclusive should be a subset of uh, the CPU set CPU. So the CPU CPU contains both the exclusive CPU and the non-exclusive non -exclusive one that can be used by the local uh, SQL. So the rest get distributed down the, the tree. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? More? Uh, yeah, some more. How much time? Yes, you have like five minutes. Okay. So uh, other details that you can check uh, afterward on the record. And finally, the no hertz full CPU set interface that I'm talking about for 10 years. Uh, so what this is all about, uh, no hertz full has to be uh, perm, um, defined on boot uh, using a kernel, kernel boot parameter. And once you do that, it's fixed on stone and, until the last reboot. You cannot change that on the runtime. And for 10 years, the plan was to have a CPU set interface so that you can change that on runtime. But after working on that for several years, I realized that it's very complicated to do. It's not infeasible, but it's going to bring a lot of uh, complications on the kernel. Mainly when you change, uh, when you add uh, no hertz full dynamically you have to protect against concurrent um, source of disturbance queue. And for that, you need to protect uh, using RCU uh, read side critical sections or per CPU, using a per CPU dedicated uh, read write semaphore on several places, such as case thread creation, because there is an affinity setting here and you want to make sure you uh, don't mess up concurrently. Uh, VM stats, K thread affinity setting, many things that you need to protect against. Yeah. Did you think about just making it in a way that you have to offline, soft offline all CPUs except the boot CPU and then configure it and bring it back up because that avoids all that mess? Because it tears down all the threads, all the affinity settings are gone and you're starting basically from, yeah. from boot, right? Yeah. So that would be way, way easier than like trying to machine. adjust it on the fly because that's going to be another mess. Yeah. Like using stop machine or something no, like that? No, not stop machine. You just do your offline all the CPUs. Like, like, I mean, I mean, yeah, if, yeah, if you, I mean, if you configure that, yeah. reconfigure yeah. that yeah. thing, it's not yeah. going to be that you run the full workload already and then you magically reconfigure the yeah. whole machine. I mean, you can do that, but does it make sense? I don't think it makes mm -hmm. sense. Look at the MMIO tracer when you enable it, because the person who enabled or wrote the MMIO tracer didn't want to write it to work with SMP. So whenever you enable the MMIO tracer, it shuts down every CPU but one <laughs> to execute the code. It also finds a ton of bugs in a hot plug. I think it's even on the documentation for you to remove the timers. It advises you to turn the CPU off and on. Really? Yeah, but, it, it's a pretty, uh, it's documentation. It's pretty old. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I need to check okay. in detail because, um, yeah, okay. okay. Need to check that. It's the unit processor. Right? Yeah, 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 right. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to isolate, you want, you want to remove everything mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I need to check that. Yeah, this is not so a performance solves, critical. That should solve right? part, so, a big part of the <laughs> and, and, and the person that would say that this is a duct to tape was the person telling you to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and also if you want to isolate, you probably want to rebuild all your ski domain in the scheduler because they will going yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, that's so. Too. And that's an easy one. Well, so yeah, right. And if they have to go 
Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm not sure if uh, there might be uh, there might be workloads that are already, let's say, using a subset mm -hmm. of CPUs that don't want to be affected by a reconfiguration. Yeah, but then yeah, you, then, uh, you just, can, then you can just then you can just offline Come the on. CPUs you yeah. care about, right? Um, I mean, either you do offline only them, or you yeah. actually. I mean, it's mostly you won't reconfigure a, a machine which is used already running the big database and whatever the hell i mean that doesn't make sense that's an artificial use case and a, a mostly academic problem to solve yeah it's, yeah, it's, yeah i mean there's, there's I mean, a lot of academics in the room it's one thing it's easier it's easier than rebooting yeah yeah of course. it's easier than rebooting yeah no, but rebooting is easy actually no no i mean for the people at yeah, least yeah, right. the system is up your boss wants to Talking about something like uh, a Kubernetes workload, that's not something you want to. I mean, if, if it's really in progress and running, and you want to do some reconfiguration, you really don't want to try and tear the whole thing down, right? I mean, so you, you're going to have a. If you're going to go in and say offline all the CPUs, um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, is it is it about particular CPU set reconfiguration or about? bringing the whole thing into no heads full at, in the first place. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the main question. What do you want to do? Well, doing the offline and is still going to be faster than rebooting because you Here got, you're, yeah. Cause you, when you have a power on self test that takes 10 minutes, you really don't want to reboot. Right. So, you're entering the next uh, phase. I don't know oh, okay. if you want to interrupt it, but it's yours. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and maybe one, one thing that makes it easier just to turn the CPU off, you might not need to turn them all off back and forth because of that string that you have on RCU. Just have a per CPU value and turn that on and off and then mm -hmm. go to the next on and off. You don't need to do all back and forth. Maybe maybe turn makes things easier. Okay, I'm going to look at the CPU Yeah, I'm going to look at yeah. Because it takes all the stuff mm -hmm. and rebuilds it when we are right. Right. It's like rebooting. But it's like reboot, so... It's more free. It's more free, yeah. It's just one step. Because the complication is not just that. It's also an RCU. Just put the slide on here. The, so the offloading and de-offloading callbacks. Even if you uh, put all CPUs down except the boot CPUs, you still have to work with... Uh, uh, actually, it could simplify that as well, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> you get it. Lot job security. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's yeah. worth considering. Yeah, we need to move it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.